You want to know why your brain lights up more than a casino slot machine next to your time and home when you're watching an action sequence in John Wick? Is it, is it because of the loud noises or the bright lights or maybe it's John's hair? Those play a part but no, it's because you're hooked before they even start the action. It's because they nearly perfected this part. Yeah. It's majesticated during the action scenes is great. But it isn't the only method used to keep your attention captive before the first trigger is even pulled. They nearly perfected the tension builder. Action really just gets piano dropped on you. They hint the coming violence, almost like you can hear a faint clock ticking down. Oh, you know something is about to go down. Audio, subtext, cinematography and John's hair are all dialed to 11. And then a moment of silence before. Arguably the most iconic example is the very first action sequence in the franchise. We get a big sentimentality scoop on a sugar cone of approaching violence. John peeks out of the shadow just before we get the first glimpse of why he is the boogeyman. That's how you do attention bullet. The audience is hooked before the action even begins. After the boogeyman tears through the city getting his revenge and showing Mother Russia his daddy, he gets his stuff back and heads home. But his reputation comes knocking and John is visited by Santino. After John ignorantly disowns the blood oath he took, which he probably never intended to keep in the first place as that is the mark he used to get out. Santino's entitlement flares up and he levels the house. And this is where the second installment took the podium in my brain as probably the best one. I'm still chewing. Never do they say, oh this is the consequences of your actions, as they do in the third one. Show, sure, don't tell. John grievingly basked in his house burning down, building to an emotional callback later. John's light coloured casuals is replaced with a boogeyman's black suit. And I'm a sucker for these highbrow hotel conversations that sound so friendly and la di -da when they're actually arm stealing and gearing up for a killing spree. It is so well done while also fleshing out the sprawling underworld that we only got sparks of in the previous one. During the preparation montage, they cut to another tension builder, a shot of Ares, yes, that is a name, looking down at John as if he is the prey being stalked by a predator. So John unwillingly completes the marker, and it is painfully obvious that Santino is not a stand-up guy. He wants his sister out of the picture, but is too cowardly to do it himself because of his immense love and brotherly protective instinct towards her. Stevie Wonder can see this guy is going to want to get rid of John once the marker is completed, but there's no boring unseasoned dialogue in a cozy museum about how they're going to do it. They build to this coming betrayal through cinematography. John starts sneaking his way through the catacombs. There's this mirror shot where John looks down at Yana in the same predatory shot, establishing a connection between them, showing that in this act, Gianna is the prey, but from Ares' perspective, John is the one being hunted. The camera tracks them both as they make their way through the festival, cutting from one to the other, reinforcing this connection between Gianna and John through the use of cinematography and camera cut. Another piece in this Russian nesting doll of tension builders is the first interaction with Cassia. The subject is so baked into the conversation and I do love my pastries. I couldn't get enough of these short conversations that carried so much weight in these scenes. Once the marker is done, the table flips and John goes from the predator to the prey and the foreshadowed betrayal comes to fruition in this scene with only four words. Or oh, well, two words and two hand jujitsu signs. I also don't know how there's not more deaf or at least hard of hearing assassins. I mean, listen to this. Maybe it's survival of the fittest situation. Maybe being deaf is like a death sentence. It wasn't the reason she died, but I wouldn't have been surprised if it was. Even though her character was as well developed as her hearing, when she died, the subtext generated enough emotional payoff in the last interaction they had to have a real impact. Just before waving goodbye, she signed, be seeing you, which was a reoccurring intimidation tactic. But they mistakenly took John for prey. He's no one's prey, and they paid the price. John simply responds with, sure. It wasn't necessary to say, no you won't, like in John Wick 3. You can rely on your audience to extrapolate. The third one suffered from a lack of subtext with the dialogue rubbing it in your face, and it really took the tension out of a lot of the dialogue. After Santino is blown away by his own stupidity in the Continental, we are launched into the final sequence, and it is 10 minutes of excellence. John is found in his burned down house as he finds his wife's keepsakes. John returning to the house is him slowly coming to the terms with the consequences of his original refusal of the marker, and he sinks deeper into the emotional depths. 
The concierge smilingly summons John to the principal's office, and after Bergen broke the house rules in the first one, we know what the consequences could hold for John after he did the same. Luckily, Winston has a big old soft spot for John. It gives him a head start after giving him a fatal warning. Without the need for any dialogue using audio and ambiguous visual cues, John comes to terms with what the future holds. I'm always torn in the scene. He's been through hell, but so much of it is self-inflicted. So of course there's a sense of empathy, but also he is not even remotely blameless. We can understand to an extent why he reacted the way he did. The two sides of him, the sentimental and loyal John, and the dark and merciless Pokemon that enjoys what this underworld has to offer. The use of blocking and shadows only lighting one half of someone's face. We all have a darker side. Sentimentality reflected on his bedside table displaying his wife's bracelet and Daisy's collar. He's loyal when he tells Francis to go home and not killing Cassian, but he's also very easily manipulated by Santino and emotional when he kills him out of revenge, knowing how it will reflect on Winston and the Continental, and knowing what the high table is capable of and how ruthless they are. Winston has his darker side, he's helpful and is willing to break the rules to help John, but also uses him in getting his hotel back in the last movie. John got out of the business because of his wife, and what was he planning on doing after she's gone? I think he would have been pulled back gradually regardless of the vehicle. He's not called the boogeyman just because he is simply good, he's the boogeyman because he is ruthless tenacious and enjoys what he's good at. I know there was some locker room insult aimed towards the third one, but at least I never had the subway scene. I hope my video entertained you more than John Wick's running, and if it did, please consider subscribing so I can start making my own gold coins, and remember to give your good boy or good girl a bit. They deserve it. Thanks for watching.